Thank you, Andrew, and, and I thank Rainforest Innovations for inviting me back again. Uh, uh, I'll be reporting on our progress on uh, this all solid state caricula technology that is being developed in my laboratories at UNM. Um, the, the sort of the pertaining uh, uh, patents uh, are down here in addition to some uh, pending ones and, uh, and applications. Uh, so um, let me just start by uh, acknowledging the folks that work in my lab, uh, my uh, graduate students, uh, some of them have already graduated these two, uh, John Wei Mang and Said Rustami. He's now my postdoc and uh, including the other uh, uh, senior research scientists in my group, Azura Volpi and Ale uh, Alexander Albrecht. Also, we have a number of collaborators um, that, uh, in particular, Marcus Helen from Los Alamos, Mauro Tonelli uh, from uh, Pisa, Italy, and Richard Epstein, uh, uh, and uh, Seth Melgard from Sandia. And Richard has uh, its with uh, thermodynamic films, formerly also he was at Los Alamos. Our current funding is. Uh, uh, from AFOSR through MURI, uh, uh, and in particular, these two DARPA phase twos, uh, sorry, these two STTR phase twos, one of them from DARPA, the other one from ARO. And also we have some small funding from Sandia through LDRD collaboration with Seth Melgard. Um, so yeah, let me start say who benefits uh, from this technology from, uh, uh, or, or in general from cry coolers. And to answer that, we say first uh, uh, realizing that many devices need to be cooled to cryogenic temperatures. Now, of course, to that we have to uh, first define what is cryogenic temperature. If you Google it, they say that's the science of very low temperatures, but typically it's anything below 150 Kelvin uh, or 150 degrees below room temperature in centigrade, uh, it's regardless, uh, is regarded as cryogenic. Uh, NIST, for example, defines it around, at around 93 Kelvin. And of course you have the liquid nitrogen. So in this area, that's cryogenic. Um, this Peltier is what uh, ther thermoelectric coolers. Um, and uh, so, uh, these are, that's the only solid state cryocooler. So anything below that, essentially we call it uh, cryogenic. Um, now, uh, many devices, as I mentioned, terrestrial or space applications need to be cooled. For example, IR sensors and cameras, gamma ray sensors and superconducting devices, uh, especially that, uh, you know, in, in the future, uh, in uh, quantum computing, they might, uh, there is a big chance they might use superconducting devices and they all need to be cooled to very low temperatures. Um, uh, in more niche, applica niche applications would be uh, the things that even uh, require and demand uh, low vibrations. In particular, these are uh, the one that we are working on is the reference cavity for high precision metrology. I'll talk about this uh, later on, and also cry, uh, cryo-electron microscopy or in general cryogenic microscopy because they require very low vibrations. Um, now, the, uh, obviously there is almost a century old technology in making cryocoolers, right? And, and it's pretty mature and advanced. In particular, the mechanical cryocoolers, and I have listed a number of them here, like Sterling, Pulse Tube, Gifford McMahon, and all of that, and, and many more, uh, they use pumps and of course they uh, uh, and move fluids and uh, uh, they have vibrations, of course, but they're very efficient. They have, uh, you know, they provide high heat relief uh, and uh, they achieve very low temperatures, some of them even sub-Kelvin. But again, on the downside, as I mentioned, because they're mechanical, they have vibrations. And all, of course, because of that, also they have lifetime issues that uh, you, know, you uh, cannot run them forever. Uh, and um, there is uh, wear and tear in there. 
and of course, there's also continuous flow or bath cry stats. That means these are the ones that like liquid nitrogen in a tank and it, and it flows into a cry stat. They have typically very large footprint and, uh, but they are, have low vibrations. And of course, there are thermoelectric coolers or Peltier coolers at the end, uh, these things, um, th but those not considered cryogenic. They're typically good for temperatures, you know, close to 200 Kelvin. And if you want to go even to, you know, they could go to slightly lower temperatures, but they have very low heat because you have to cast, um, uh, put a lot of them together, uh, cascade them, um, stack them together. Um, now, the, our innovation or this innovation is optical refrigeration, which I will shortly in my next slide tell you how it works. But the advantages that this technology offers is, of course, it's the only existing all solid state cry cooler technology. It can uh, potentially cool to 70 to 80 Kelvin, those that are based on rare earth doped uh, materials. So they are, because of their all solid state, they're totally vibration free. They have gimbal agility, meaning that they have a, a you know, they can be made very, a very small cooling he head tethered to a fiber optics. So they can be moved very quickly for certain applications. And because they're uh, solid state, also the moving part, they have long lifetime. The only lifetime is limited by the a lifetime of the laser and they're getting better and better. And again, because of all of that, also they have cooling on demand. That means they can be shut off and turned on at any time. And uh, so there is no risk that they may fail in that uh, respect. Uh, these two pictures, one is an artist rendition of a, such a device. And of course the one on the right is one of our early prototypes that we, uh, uh, developed in our laboratory a few years ago. Um, so, of course, on the downside, currently, right now, the efficiency of these things are very low. And the temperature that we can achieve are around, uh, you know, it's uh, for the in rare earth based systems are larger than 70 Kelvin. Of course, in semiconductors, which is the holy grail of laser cooling, if we ever cool a semiconductor, that those are a potential to reach very low temperatures. Um, but if you have, if you can, you want to know more about it, you can ask me questions at the end. Um, but right now, the, my focus would be on the rare earth and especially ytterbium based systems. Uh, so what is optical refrigeration? Again, it's uh, technology, uh, this thing has, since the early days of quantum mechanics was predicted in 1929. Uh, by Pringsheim in Germany. It first was observed almost 65 years later by, by Richard Epstein and his group at Lanel in 1995. And then at UNM, we uh, demonstrated the first cryogenic cooling and the real, the only, uh, the first application uh, of that the cooling a device was demonstrated just two years ago by my group. Now, what is optical refrigeration? Essentially, is removing heat using a laser. So a laser goes through, a, say, a crystal here uh, of the order of one centimeter cube. And, uh, uh, and what happens is that it absorbs light and emits light with higher energy or, or in terms of these are the frequency of the laser and uh, the frequency is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So, uh, so the wavelength of the emitted light is bluer or slightly shorter wavelength then what uh, it gets absorbed and that's what it carries heat and entropy away from the system. Um, now the physics, uh, if you want to know more about physics, again, that's the laser. You have a crystal sitting in there. These guys are, let's say, ytterbium ions. These are the ones that absorb light. Uh, these are the, uh, and what we call the dopants. And sitting there, of course, there's always some bad actors there that cause heat, they absorb the like transition metals. And that's why it took such a long time to observe this because you need really high purity crystals. So in terms of energy diagrams, you absorb light and then it emits from these energy levels at higher energy. Uh, now, this gives you a snapshot of the progress that has been made since the early days. That's in 1995, the first cooling was done in 
ytterbium that are doped in glass. The z -blan is a type of glass that was developed in early days for uh, fiber optics industry. And uh, of course, it's, uh, they, only, uh, they could only cool it to above 200 Kelvin. And then uh, in around uh, 2007 or so, uh, UNM group, we focused on crystals and we have been successively, uh, uh, progressively getting better and better results. Uh, and uh, the, our record is around 87 Kelvin that we have cooled from room temperature, uh, a ytterbium doped YLF crystal, okay? Um, of course, these are all the experiments that were done for a bare crystal, no, nothing attached to it. Of course, the ultimate goal that was touted from the beginning or the inception of this uh, uh, technology of laser cooling of solids was to use this as a, 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 to cool a load and have a universal cold finger, something that you can attach any load to it, any sensor. And, and uh, this was, of course, achieved two years ago. And we developed, uh, and, and of course, that involved uh, a number of engineering innovations that we de developed here. Uh, including a multi-pass cavity for enhancing the absorption of the pump because the uh, pump is absorbed very little in every pass. There is was the, this thermal link issue because we had to uh, have shield the load, whatever it is, uh, this is sitting here from all the fluorescence that comes. Otherwise the fluorescence would hit it and, uh, and heat it. So we developed this thermal link. Um, uh, by the way, there is a pending uh, uh, application for uh, this particular link, which is a textured magnesium fluoride, because it has to be a CTE match, is coefficient thermal expansion, otherwise uh, they break. And of course, there is uh, thermal isolation, thermal management. Uh, so it involved a lot of engineering innovations. And uh, the, uh, at the end, what it resulted was in the cooled a mercury cadmium telluride and IR detector to 100, uh, below 135 Kelvin. So that was uh, sort of uh, got a lot of nice press, uh, a lot of uh, praise by a uh, number of prestigious journals like Nature Photonics and what made the cover of Laser Focus World magazine uh, because it was the demonstration of the first all solid state cryocooler. Um, and um, more, more recently, we have cooled uh, 228 Kelvin. Uh, and again, I'll tell you that this, um, this last mile uh, or the getting cooler and cooler, of course, it's, it, it requires a lot of th uh, thermal management. Now, why is it that we are pushing right now our goal, which is uh, the, the, uh, from this DARPA STTR phase two or is phase two B is to cool a silicon cavity, uh, which I'll shortly tell you what it is, to 124 Kelvin, right? And this is in collaboration with Juni's group at NIST, right? Now, uh, the, the reason we are uh, uh, want to do that is that at, at Juni's group at NIST, they have right now developed the most stable laser, or for that matter, the, the most precise clock in the world, which is a laser that is uh, has a line width of 40 millihertz. Now, to put in perspective, that means it, it, it acts like a clock that its error is one second in 14 billion years or the age of universe, right? So this essentially is a game changer in terms of the most precise clock for um, GPS or um, essentially pre uh, precision metrology. Now, the way they do this, achieve that, they, they, uh, they have a laser that is locked to a reference cavity. And that reference cavity has to be super stable, which is made out of a single crystal silicon, but they have to cool it to 124 Kelvin because that's the temperature that its thermal expansion coefficient goes to zero, right? But this is our, our arduous task to do this with a no vibration because it's, uh, uh, any vibrations could mess up this uh, stability of this cavity. So this is, has a giant footprint and it's not something that would, you know, you can bring it and uh, uh, m make a device out of it. It's right now a laboratory demonstration. So if we can uh, 
uh, integrate our cryocooler, our solid state cryocooler with their reference cavity. And this is again an artist's rendition of that. With, uh, uh, it, it can have very small put, uh, footprint and, and, and it, it would be truly a game changer. And here is, if you look at the inside, Essentially, the optical refrigerator part is going to be very small with the fiber laser connected to it, obviously. Uh, these are just the cooling fans and the silicon cavity is sitting there, right? So that's, uh, again, we also the, for this, just cooling this uh, uh, is one of the patterns that we have. Uh, all right, now, uh, we, we hope that within the next, uh, within the next year or so, we, we will be uh, hopefully getting this and integrate that with this that silicon cavity. Now, uh, as I said, one of the things, one of the downsides of the optical refrigeration is that the efficiency is not that high. It's of the order of a percent or so, right? So we need to uh, develop techniques and technology to in increase the efficiency. One way is to go to other materials, right? In other words, in, uh, instead of tulium, uh, sorry, ytterbium that we are using, which is around one micron uh, laser uh, wavelength, if we go to longer wavelengths, because the cooling efficiency roughly scales with the wavelength. So if we go two micron right there, we double the efficiency. So we've been working on this for many years, but more, most recently, I, I just last year, we, uh, we uh, showed that we can cool this homium dope uh, barium lithium fluoride or BIF, and which shows a lot of promise to, uh, to achieve not only very low temperatures, actually this, it can go to 130 Kelvin, but also if we make it even purer, it can go to much lower temperatures with double the efficiency, right? And this is also one of our pending applications uh, 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 apologize. Um, okay, and, and the next thing about future directions in, in terms of enhancing the wall plug efficiency is what is called fluorescence recycling. And again, this is uh, the typical uh, optical cryocooler. The laser gets in there, gets absorbed, and the heat is carried out by fluorescence. And the fluorescence essentially gets dumped into the heat sink, right? But again, for every watt of laser absorbed, you have one plus slightly higher fluorescence that gets out, right? And it gets wasted. Now, if you recycle, capture this fluorescence and recycle it, then you can uh, improve the efficiency drastically. And, 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 and of course, uh, an easy way is to coat the walls of the chamber with photovoltaic cells. Now photovoltaics or solar cells, of course, for narrow band light, like what is coming from uh, the, uh, for the fluorescence that being emitted by these crystals can be very efficient. So uh, in sort of backup, uh, and in that case, you can uh, capture all, uh, all the, uh, the electricity from these photovoltaics and recycle it. So, and, and for example, the cooling efficiency would be enhanced by uh, uh, one uh, over one minus the uh, efficiency of these photovoltaics. And these photovoltaics, again, for narrow band emission can reach around 80% currently or even higher for lower ambient temperatures like on a satellite. So this uh, potentially could enhance the efficiency tenfold. And this is one of these low hanging fruits that we would definitely would like to do, but we haven't had funding necessarily, uh, or uh, so far uh, are the applications that we've been working on like cooling of the silicon cavity, they don't care about the efficiency that much. So we, um, this is something that we certainly would like to do um, in terms of showing the efficiency. With that, I thank you all for your attention. And if there's any questions, uh,